Hey everyone! Welcome to Killer Bites, a show where we talk true crime all the time. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the strange and unusual case of Peter Porco. There really is nothing worse than when family members turn on each other and fights become fatal. But in the case of New York parents, Peter and Joan Porco, who were attacked in their bed one night while they slept, something unbelievable would happen a few hours after the attack that would make the case so much more remarkable, specifically in the world of forensic science. They say that dead men tell no tales, but the corpse at this crime scene really said, couldn't be me. 52-year-old Peter Porco was a court clerk in the Supreme Court of New York State and took his job very seriously. He was a portly man with a wide smile, a friendly face, and was very responsible. So one day when Peter Porco didn't show up to work, people started to worry. The man loved his job, and it just wasn't like him to not come into work. A court officer went to the Porco household to check on him, and when he got to the home, the officer found a very gruesome scene. A trail of red drops led their way towards the entrance of the house. That's one scavenger hunt I would not want to be a part of. The front door of the house was ajar, with a singular key by itself still in the lock. When the officer stepped inside, it appeared that there had been a vicious struggle. Red was smeared along the doors and walls and tracked everywhere throughout the home. The officer looked to his right and saw a body laying there motionless, who he recognized as Peter Porco. Based on the look of it all, it was clear he'd been fatally bludgeoned. This scene was so brutal, most people who saw it in person still have difficulty talking about it today. After the initial shock, investigators went upstairs and found the body of Joan Porco, who seemed to have suffered a similar fate. Lying in the bed next to her was a three foot long fireman's ax. Investigators could see pieces of her brain matter on the pillow. And that's when they realized Joan was still alive. They rushed her to the hospital for emergency surgery and were ultimately able to save her life. To give you a picture of how bad it was, the paramedics were trying to put the oxygen mask over her mouth on the way to the hospital, and they realized they couldn't figure out where her mouth was. So when they say it was an absolute miracle that Joan survived, they meant it. It was also incredible how well they were able to reconstruct her face. She lost a part of her skull, her eye, and a portion of her face, but whoever did her surgery did a bang up job because she seriously looks amazing. Science rules. Analysts suggested that Joan had been struck three times in the head by the axe, while Peter had suffered an agonizing 16 blows. But why was Peter's body found downstairs? Get ready for your world to be rocked. Forensic experts said that sometime during the night after the attack, Peter regained consciousness and started going about his morning routine. He was found with some of his clothes pulled on over his wounds, which suggested he tried to get dressed for work before he started walking around the house half alive. How was this possible? Y'all ready for some science? Set phasers to fun, nerds. The top part of Peter's brain, the neocortex, which controls functions like thought, language, and reasoning, was damaged severely during those 16 whacks to the head. However, the autopsy revealed that his paleocortex, the part of the brain buried underneath the neocortex, was still intact. The paleocortex, as its name suggests, controls the primal instincts, aka the second nature stuff that you don't have to think about anymore. That is why Peter had gone about his morning routine like normal upon regaining consciousness and had gotten dressed, gone downstairs, made himself breakfast, and did the tasks that he'd normally done every single morning for the past few decades while he was gravely wounded. Do you guys ever have that thing where you get to work or school and you realize you don't even remember driving there? Like you just go into autopilot? That's essentially what was happening to Peter. And somewhere deep in the caveman part of his brain, he was still trying to perform the routine he always had. Say thanks to your paleocortex. The spatter evidence then showed that he even went out to get his morning newspaper. But because he was, you know, the literal walking dead, he didn't realize the door shut behind him and automatically locked. But Peter wasn't done for yet. As his final move in this world, he went into the flower pot and pulled out the spare house key, let himself inside, and then slumped to the floor, and he was gone. 
the newspaper he'd just gone out to get was lying next to his body. Can you even imagine if you were the one person out there that morning walking your dog and you just see this man with a gaping head wound lumbering out to get his paper in a daze? I would literally think the apocalypse had just started. And speaking of near-death experiences, Joan was fighting for her life as she was loaded into the ambulance and rushed to surgery. An officer who personally knew Joan was in the ambulance with her and he was able to ask her a question before she was whisked off to surgery. He asked her if she knew who did this to her, and she nodded her head yes. He asked her if Christopher did this to her, and she very clearly nodded her head yes. Christopher was her 21-year-old son. Oof, that's gotta hurt. It was clear that Peter had been the main target of the attack, and when nothing appeared to have been taken from the home, the investigators theorized that this was a personal attack out of anger orchestrated by a family member. In total, Peter and Joan had two sons. 23-year-old Jonathan was serving as a lieutenant in the Navy and was literally on a submarine 20,000 miles away. So nothing really pointing to him at the moment. And 21-year-old Christopher was a student at University of Rochester, which was just a three-hour drive away. Both of the brothers had alibis for the night of the attack. So why did Joan indicate that Christopher was the one who had done this? When Christopher was questioned, they told him that his mom said he was there, and he adamantly denied it. Three weeks later, Joan awoke from her coma, but now Joan was suddenly telling the police that Christopher had nothing to do with the attack. Ah, the old bait and switch. All of a sudden, she's like, no, no, it couldn't have been Christopher. Leave my son alone. She also made this big public statement in the newspaper saying that her son was not involved in the crime and that the police were pursuing him as a suspect from the start before they had any evidence. She begged the district attorney's office to leave her son alone and to search for her husband's real slayer. Ooh, hun, I think the call is coming from inside the house, if you know what I'm saying. There was no DNA evidence found in Christopher's car, and police couldn't even prove that Christopher had been on the highway that night. There were toll roads he would have taken to drive home, and they would have recorded his toll pass as he drove through them. The police didn't want to give up on Christopher, but they didn't want to stick their horse blinders on too quickly either, so they started investigating other options. An anonymous letter was sent to the newspaper from someone claiming to have been Peter's slayer. The writer took credit for another local slaying and warned he would do it again. There was no DNA evidence on the letter and they couldn't trace where it came from. So all they could do was hope the person would write again while they continued their search. But they never heard from this anonymous letter writer again. They found out that both Joan and Peter had life insurance policies that totaled $1 million. And they also learned that Christopher Porco had asked for investment advice right before the alleged axeman struck. Christopher had visited a financial counselor and asked him to write up a portfolio for him, allegedly telling his counselor he was gonna be receiving a million dollars from a relative soon. Oh really, Chris? Who's that coming from? Christopher's emails also revealed that he'd been communicating with his dad right before the attack and had been asking him for his personal financial information. He asked for their social security numbers and their driver's license numbers that he said was for financial paperwork he needed to fill out for the next semester. Sure. They also found that the master code had been punched into the home alarm to disable it at two in the morning, a code only known by the family and two other trusted people. Investigators were convinced that it had to have been a family member. The perpetrator had punched in the alarm code before smashing the alarm, thinking that that would cover their tracks. But too bad that information was stored somewhere deep in the cloud already. And smashing that alarm system would do nothing to help Chris cover his tracks. Oops, sorry. I mean, the intruder. Even though Joan maintained her son's innocence, the investigators wanted to get a closer look at where Christopher claimed he was the night of the crime. He said he was in his dorm room over 200 miles away when the attack happened. So investigators reached out to Rochester campus and got the security tapes from the dorm building, along with the camera footage from all the major freeways and toll booths in between the Porco's home and the university. Luckily, Christopher drove a bright yellow Jeep, so he was easy to look for. Investigators scanned every inch of the roads for Christopher's Jeep, 
and at 10.30 p.m., they spotted a yellow Jeep on the security tapes leaving the University of Rochester's campus. The security alarm at the Porco's home was deactivated at 2.14 a.m., a little over three and a half hours later. So that timeline fit. The phone line was cut at 4.59 a.m., and the yellow Jeep was caught on a security camera returning to campus at 8.30 a.m. A little over three and a half hours later, the timeline now fit perfectly. But could they prove that this was specifically Christopher's Jeep? Apparently, New Yorkers love their yellow gas guzzlers. There were way more people who owned yellow Jeeps at the university than they anticipated. So they ran the images from the security cameras through a computer filter, hoping to get a better look at the Jeep. After that, they could then make out mud splatters on the passenger side of the Jeep. They noticed the passenger side window had a torn parking sticker on it. There was also a political bumper sticker on the back tire cover. They compared those photos with ones they'd taken of Christopher's Jeep a day after the incident, and it was an exact match. But the one thing the photographic analysis couldn't prove was whether Christopher or someone else had been driving the car. Like a douchebag with something to hide, those windows were tinted. And remember how Christopher had to pass through a toll booth on the highway to get between the two places, but there was no recording of him doing so? The authorities found that the small electronic toll pass had been removed from the windshield and hidden under the dashboard so the signal couldn't be picked up. Like he'd been trying to hide his tracks. The investigators realized there were no security cameras where people at the tolls had to pay cash, so Christopher had most likely gone through that way. One teller remembered a yellow Jeep coming through her booth around 11 p.m. that night, right before she was off, but she couldn't remember what the driver looked like. Each person who pays cash gets a ticket handed to them that's time-stamped, then they stick the ticket in a slot that allows them onto the toll road. Only 12 vehicles went through that particular toll booth that night, so they gathered the tickets from the booth and sent them for DNA testing. When the test came back that a few tickets had been found with DNA on them, they were hopeful. And when they found out that one of the tickets had come back as an exact match to Christopher Porco's DNA profile, they were ecstatic. Luckily, our boy was nice and sweaty that night, so he left a hella extensive trail of skin cells on his ticket. Thank you, mitochondrial DNA testing. You really are the powerhouse of the cell. After considering the elements of the case, prosecutors believed that the motive was money. Investigators found that Christopher had forged his parents' signature on some bank loan documents and borrowed $30,000 without their permission. Then they found an email from Peter to his son. The email from Peter said that if Christopher ever abused his credit again, he would be forced to file a forgery affidavit. He suggested Christopher come home so they could talk, and he signed off by saying despite the fact that they were disappointed in him, they still loved him. Christopher's world was caving in on him, and he could do nothing to stop it. He was failing his college courses, his dad had cut off his funds, and he was quickly running out of money. Not only that, but the investigators had found out that Christopher had a record of breaking into his own parents' home and stealing from them before. In 2003, Christopher had broken into his parents' home and stolen a laptop from him that he then sold on eBay for money. They also found out that he had been scamming people on eBay by pretending to sell things from his brother's eBay account. His gag was he would sell an item and then never send it to the customers, claiming that he was the brother of the seller and that the seller had passed away. While they analyzed Christopher's history of burglaries and pathological lies, they started to get an image of a very antisocial personality. They concluded that his personality and lack of a moral compass was consistent with that of a sociopath. Prosecutors believed that Christopher chose to swing the ax on his parents in exchange for their life insurance money. After the prosecutors were certain they'd solidified a timeline and a motive, they had only one piece left to their puzzle. They wanted to know why Joan had changed her story and claimed her son now had nothing to do with it. While it's not uncommon for people with head injuries to lose memory from around the time of the event, they wanted to know why she told them Chris had done it when she was in the ambulance. Maybe because she'd just lost the love of her life and didn't want to lose one of the last two people she had left in the world? A year after the attack, 
Christopher went on trial while his mother stood by him and maintained his innocence the entire time. But the jury saw that the evidence was overwhelming and found him guilty, sentencing him to a minimum of 50 years in prison. Christopher's mother, to this day, still believes he is innocent. In the world of Christopher Porco, if you don't get your way, it's totally acceptable to chop up your own parents and blame it on someone else. Uh, just so long as you get the life insurance payout, of course. I think it's rather fitting now that one of the two people in the world that Christopher Porco had tried to rid himself of, one of them will be one of his only visitors in jail for the rest of his life. Thanks for watching.